Okay. So I want to welcome here on this session Zuzana Tomáš uh, from uh, Michigan, Eastern Michigan University, uh, Luz Avruy from uh, Kleis, Alina Rusu from Romania, and Bojana Kulub Ilic from University in Rijeka. These are our four, four ladies who are the speakers today. So uh, please, ladies, can you introduce yourself a little bit and maybe explain your connection with the service learning? So, Zuzka. Okay, I can start. Hello, everybody. Dobry deň. Uh, my name is Zuzana Tomáš, um, former Zuzana Sharikova. I am originally from Slovakia, moved to the United States in 2000. I am an alumna of Matej Bell University, a proud alumna, and I am really hoping to spend some time at Matej Bell next fall, pending Fulbright application. So hopefully I'll meet some of you in person. Uh, I think soon Algebeta is going to start playing music like in Oscars if we speak too long. So uh, very quickly, uh, my connection to service learning, I was teaching future teachers and I was sitting in the classroom and I was thinking to myself, we have all these amazing immigrants and international people in our community. And why am I teaching my teachers how to teach while we sit in the classroom at the university instead of actually teaching in the community providing free uh, English instruction. And that was really sort of the, uh, the moment when I realized I want to do things differently. I want to do more experiential learning. And I think another question has to do with what helped me get there. So I'll wait, uh, wait with that for now, but thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello. Sure. Hello. Good morning for me. Um, too early for wine. <laughs> um, my name is Luz Abruja. I live in Buenos Aires in Argentina. And um, I, I, well, probably as many of you, I used to be, I mean, I started working as a volunteer when I was very young. I was in middle school uh, and I loved it. And I loved the feeling of, you know, feeling responsible for the things that were not working and, and feeling that I could do something about that. And then I started, when I was older, I started working in education and I had the feeling that I had these two uh, parallel roads in a way. Um, you know, the, the serving the community and working with people and youth and, and uh, putting all my passion into something. And then a more traditional um, way of working in education. And when I met, let's say, service learning, I realized that these two parallel roads could meet at some point. And that was when I realized that this was my thing. Um, I started working at the Latin American Center for Service Learning, CLIS, around 10 years ago um, in training first. And then, well, lately I, I became, let's say, the, the coordinator of um, institutional relations and networks. Um, and I've been working well with Betka, with Alina, with Boyana, with several of you. I met some of you, well, with Julia lately. Um, I met several of you in, in Slovakia some years ago because I have also been working in a, pro in a program that intends to promote service learning in Central and Eastern Europe. That's why even though I'm from Argentina, I don't live in Central and Eastern Europe, not even in Europe. Um, I, I was uh, luckily invited to, to this event. Um, I think that's, well, about my studies, my original studies have to do with uh, nonprofit management. And then I specialized in education. And I'm always like coming and going from these two fields and, and merging them in service learning. I guess that's it for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Boyana. Hi, hello everyone. Um, so back to the origins, actually uh, my own experience, the first one with service learning was when I was a student. My last year of my own graduate study of uh, pedagogy here at the University of Rijeka, I decided to spend uh, in the United States at West Virginia University. And it was an extraordinary um, experience for me. And I remember thinking at the time how actually sad I was that I was actually at my last year of my own 
you know, uh, study of pedagogy and that my own educational path uh, at a university of Rijeka hadn't been, you know, enriched by this kind of learning and, and serving uh, opportunity. So I think that having that kind of, um, you know, student perspective, you know, entering the service learning was really um, an aha moment, you know, for me, you know, thinking that this is actually how education at university should look like, like all the time, you know, not depending on the discipline background, not depending on the structure of the study program, there should be always at least some, you know, space um, for such learning and service experience. Um, so when I started to, uh, when I started working at, uh, at a university, I just, you know, immediately grabbed the opportunity of having some sort of freedom because I started as a teaching and research assistant and I, um, you know, presented this whole uh, pedagogy and methodology to the professors who were holding the courses at a time. And they were, I mean, I was, you know, lucky enough at the time that they felt that it was the right thing to do as well. So they gave me a certain, you know, freedom and space to create some of the exercising following service learning uh, methodology. And, you know, easily step by step, step by step, now being here 16 uh, years at a university, I now have my own courses that are completely based on service learning methodology. Great, thank you. And Alina? I'm so happy and excited to see you all here. Thank you, Betka, for this opportunity. Uh, I am Alina Russo from Romania, Cluj-Napoca. Uh, some of you, I know you visited Cluj, and you are invited to visit it as soon as we can travel again. <laughs> and um, I, I, uh, I am a biologist and a psychologist. I am currently based at the School of uh, Psychology and Sciences of Education. I'm like many of you, PhD coordinator in uh, currently in sciences of education. I, I did that uh, for 10 years in psychology. But uh, I think I've been doing service learning for probably 15 years, but I didn't know what I was doing uh, because uh, I was, uh, I'm, I'm teaching animal psychology and psychobiology of sexuality. So I always, I was always involved in uh, students coordination, in um, cooperation with NGOs, you know, placing them to do field education, but um, uh, stimulating them to do their own projects and then report and reflect. And then in 2015, I had the chance to meet uh, a professor from Rutgers University uh, from US, uh, from New Jersey. And she was here with a group of students uh, and she was willing to meet our students. And she said that we were in a, a field education uh, week. And she asked me, are you doing service learning? I said, what? Uh, well, community oriented, uh, you know, field education. <laughs> and then I started to look, uh, uh, you know, to search in the literature about this form of pedagogy. Then I had to ch the chance to meet Claise in Vienna and uh, Betka and all the people that uh, were there. And I was very happy to do an online training about service learning. And then after the Claise uh, uh, training, I had a chance to be a Fulbright uh, scholar like Boyana and we hope Betka and uh, Zuzana, I mean, Zuzana back to <laughs> Matei Bay, fingers crossed, <laughs> okay. So then I went to, to Ruggers to see, uh, you know, to learn about the institution institutionalization process how they are doing for so many years. And of course, after uh, meanwhile and afterwards, we had the Sliha project and probably Betkai already told you about this. And I'm really grateful about that uh, project because I learned a lot and I met really valuable people. So we are still keeping contact with them. Thank you, Betka. Okay, thanks. So mainly, uh, Susanna and Luz, you mentioned like some the answers on my second questions. What, what, what was your main motivation to start service learning? So maybe if you can more deeply introduce like uh, maybe Alina or Boyana. So what, what really was for you the motivation? When, why, why did you start it with the service learning? Um, yeah, um, well, I, I think I kind of, also stepped into the into the field mm -hmm. of answering you know uh with the with the first question of simply having my own experience as a student mm -hmm. and then I just thought that um any student particularly those engaged in studying any forms of education and and pedagogy um itself 
should be able to have that kind of a learning, mm-hmm. a learning opportunity. I think it's very important for students in our own fields uh, to be given such experiential learning uh, opportunities. And um, I mean, I started with a very small uh, projects, but mm-hmm. even though they were, you know, uh, very well welcomed by the students. It was something completely new and innovative for them at the time. And, you know, keep keeping, you know, getting this kind of feedback and feeling, you know, their own satisfaction and energy. It just sort of motivated me even more to continue. And then to, um, like Alina said, you know, uh, even dig even more into the literature mm-hmm. and then combining my own research work with the teaching and service learning and expanding, you know, the social network of various organizations in the community. Um, and every single generation brought some new challenges and, and some new, uh, you know, uh, sort of satisfactory moments. And I could see that it was transforming for a lot of them. I could see that it was really making an impact on their own lives. And it was something that kind of kept me just going on and going on despite of, you know, various challenges. And I'm sure we're going to we're going to tackle into into that Mm -hmm. aspect as well a bit later. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Alina, do you want to add something? Yeah, in line with uh, Boyana said, I feel that I'm on the same page (laughs) with her. Although she had this experience as a student, I didn't have it uh, myself at that time. But I think the, the, what motivated me to go further, you know, and to try to convince and motivate other colleagues of mine to do that. Mm-hmm. And we do have some which are now implementing ser- service learning components in their courses. It was the, the motivation of students. And as Boyana said, the transformative effects that mm-hmm. the, the service learning had on them, you know. So my, the motivation was based on this um, Changement on uh, that I could see on students, and some of them continue to work with the with the NGOs. You know, mm-hmm. so even some of them they found it, so they launched their own NGOs, and I'm now collaborating with at least four NGOs founded and uh, you know established by students, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. And they by themselves, you know, those students who benefited like five years ago of the first service learning experiences. I mean, we started to use that con- the concept explicitly, you know. Then the students are now um, coordinators of NGOs and they became uh, also ambassadors of the concept. So that was mm-hmm. the main moti- one of the motivations. And another one was the uh, research opportunities, you know. I mean, many aspects uh, uh, I could found in this service learning experience that motivated me to, to do deeper research. Uh, I even had two PhD students that they were involved in um, uh, these topics, service mm-hmm. learning top- related topics. So okay. student motivations and research <laughs> that were <laughs> the two. And those? Yes, right. uh, I like the word that, that Boyana chose, transformation. Um, I, I definitely agree with Boyana and Alina. And I would add not only the transformation of students, but also the transformation of educational institutions, the ones that we work in, and education as a whole, and also the transformation of the communities that we belong to. Um, This this double, um, this simultaneous transformation that happens to the students that we work with and the institutions that we work in, and the communities that we work in, and all that happens in between, that is all the bonds that we, promote and that we help create and all what happens in the middle for that to happen. I like to say, I generally like to say that um, when we chose to be teachers or professors, I mean, I like to go back to why it is that we decided to teach a certain discipline. Um, And I generally say, I guess it's not only because of, you know, standing in front of a class and saying things, but because of an idea that education is transformative and that we may, through education, we may create a better environment for everyone and a better world. And I think that service learning has to do with that, with going back to that origin of why we believe in education, uh, of in its transformative effects, 
in why what we teach makes sense, not only to remember a certain information, but because it transforms someone or something and it makes the world that we live in a better place for more people or for everyone. Thank you for adding these components, not only students, but also like institutions and communities. Okay, can so I, let's... Uh, actually, can I, Betka, add one more thought? Why I think service learning right now is so important. In the past, we sort of knew what kinds of jobs we were preparing our students for, right? But right now, we are preparing kids and young people for jobs that don't even exist, right? So while before we could expect memorization and eventually some predictable application, I feel that right now things are so messy and so ambiguous and we live in this uncertainty. And to me, the real value of service learning also is in engaging that uncertainty, engaging that ambiguity. I mean, if there is one downside that I struggled with, it's that it's messy, right? And you constantly have to reevaluate, constantly have to adapt. You can't always pre-plan everything. And I think students don't like it sometimes, but if we can convince them that, it, that it, it's exactly the kinds of skills they need, I think they can buy into that. So I just wanted to add that little component. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks also for this reflection. Let's move to a little bit a different point that I, uh, I want to ask you, uh, because this is the session inside of the training of uh, teachers in service learning. So I was interested, uh, like how the your universities are supporting service learning and like maybe also something personal for what was for you like supportive in your work. So maybe let's broaden it the questions and not only universities but also what was for you personally supportive when you started with service learning or developing the, this idea and implementing it in your courses anybody um yeah i can i can start if that's mm -hmm. if that's okay um the institutional aspect here, uh, and I'm talking now only uh, from the perspective of the University of Rijeka, not, not the national mm -hmm. uh, perspective. It was a, a long uh, endeavor, um, not always easy one, with a lot of you know advocating, with a lot of explaining, um, with a lot of presenting uh, research and research results, trying to influence the governing you know, bodies at different levels for the start at my own faculty of humanities and social sciences, and then even you know, upwards at a, at a university management level, uh, that it was really an element of a teaching you know, and learning perspectives that we need to seriously take into account if we wanna be you know, socially relevant institution in our community, socially relevant uh, university, particularly having in mind that um, sort of to lean on what Susanna said, um, you know, these times of uncertainties also uh, bring us usually this, um, we call them non-traditional students. So there are a lot of students here at the university who are working, who are uh, parents or, you know, uh, single parents uh, who are trying to combine, you know, their private and personal life, still, you know, trying to find that space for uh, for education and, and, you know, for their own personal and professional um, improvement. So it was really important for me. I mean, I could have continued just working with service learning, you know, not caring about what's going on at the institutional uh, level. But it was really important at some point for me I really wanted my own institution, you know, to claim that it cherishes, you know, service learning, you know, as a perspective, as an approach. Uh, and it was just a couple of us, you know, at the beginning from the university who were familiar with the methodology. So we just sort of decided, okay, let's, you know, put some pressure on our deans, you know, and vice deans for the beginning. And, you know, eventually it was a couple of years I mean, of advocating, of quite strong advocating process. But then we ended up having, you know, service learning explicitly in our institutional strategies, you know. And then when you have this particular word, term in a strategy that it can translate 
into you know particular hours of teaching or um, you know strategies are usually a lot about the numbers. So for example, number of you know collaborations with community organizations, number of contracts with different kind of organizations in the community, then eventually uh, the institution itself figured out that it was really beneficial for the institution because you know it could celebrate this sort of um, you know collaboration with a community. So in every strategic report, you know, um, a vice dean or a dean could you know write down, oh, we were like super successful. We collaborated with I don't know twenty companies, thirty NGOs, with a uh, you know different kind of local stakeholders, local authorities, and all different kind of actors suddenly became, um, you know, institutional friends and, and partners. And um, it was one particular moment that I think brought the explosion at our university, and it was the reaccreditation. I'm sure that all of you are familiar uh, with the process. And it was the uh, 2015 one. Uh, you know, external accreditation board came to our university, tons of meetings of reading all different kinds of self-reflection reports and things like that. And then when their uh, report came within their decision uh, and recommendations for improvement, it was explicitly said that service learning done at a department of pedagogy is an exemplary uh, you know, perspective of how University should collaborate with university, uh, with I'm sorry, community uh, stakeholders, and that it is a practice that needs to be upscaled to every other institution where, of course, that is possible, where that can be, you know, in line with a study program. And it was that particular moment because I remember all of a sudden, within a couple of days, I was receiving tons of emails or phone calls like, what are you doing? What are you doing? What is that service learning methodology? You know, Dean calling me, Vice Dean calling me. Can, can you help other departments? All of a sudden, it was very important for the institution to actually follow recommendations, you know, done in a reaccreditation report for the practice to be upscaled. And then... You know, when the report came to the university, the university was looking out, you know, for people already engaged in service learning that could assist in, you know, implementing service learning at other institutions as well. So all of a sudden, my own institution became, you know, um, a model for service learning and, you know, people at management level and and that kind of it as well. I mean, they, they do like these sort of moments, you know, where you can pride with a certain practice coming out of your own institution and then all of a sudden, you know, within this past five years, service learning, you know, has become more and more, um, you know, of an approach that more or less everybody has at least heard about. Not everybody, of course, is doing it. But, you know, there are all different kind of aspects of support that started with institutional, you know, strategic documents and then transferred into all different kind of educational workshops, um, you know, Erasmus projects, collaborations, um, student papers, going to conferences, um, receiving rector's awards. And all of that happened actually within the last five years. So, you know, 10 years before that, we were just sort of talking and talking and talking and talking and talking until finally that was that, you know, click. It was that moment of reaccreditation. I'm positive that it was that particular moment that set this service learning, you know, perspective at, at, at our university in, in an explosion. Nice story. <laughs> we are now uh, at Matibel University in the process of reaccreditation. Re there you go. Okay, who wants to share maybe the support uh, of service learning for service learning? Maybe Zuska, it's a little bit different, no, in the US context. Yeah, so I am really humbled when I hear the stories how um, some of you basically started from scratch and had to uh, gain momentum by yourselves, had to, uh, you know, convince people that this is useful. I'm fortunate in that my university uh, has had the Carnegie Mellon Community Engagement designation since 2008. So I walked into a place where there already was a lot of acceptance and support for service learning. Uh, but I'll quickly mention two things that I find crucial in a successful 
um, support for faculty. Number one, I think it's really nice having a seminar like this that brings people together. And especially if that seminar is somehow compensated so faculty can really devote some concentrated time to doing some readings, discussions. So for example, at my university, new faculty accepted into the seminar get um, one course release. So the semester when you're taking the seminar, you don't have to teach one course. So you can really engage, you can really go deeply, you can really work on a syllabus that you want to uh, make service learning a service learning course. And number two, uh, also when we teach a service learning course, we get an additional credit because the university recognizes that this is more work. Finding partners, engaging with partners, evaluating the program, it is just a little more work than when you teach in a traditional way. So I think sort of simple uh, things that a university can do can go a long way in um, sort of faculty satisfaction and ability to pull it off. So that's that's what I wanted to add to the discussion. Thank you, Suska. Did you mention also this like benefits? It sometimes sounds for us it's not it's like the uh, you know miracle for us to have for something like less hour of teaching. It's not happening, <laughs> not only for service learning, but another like you know when you want to develop uh, yourself in something it's up to you but this is the different style of maybe the functioning of the universities betka can i lean just a bit to susanna because it's a particular us experience that mm -hmm. i had as well that's completely different you know from, from the environment here and um si since I, I i was part of you know that group that that sort of started you know from the from the scratch it was um it 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 was usually expected that I would be the one providing a certain certain support. While at, at the same time, I needed, you know, badly that kind of support on all different kind of on all different kind of levels. And in 2015-16, I was a Fulbright scholar at Portland State uh, University in Oregon, and I'm sure Susanna will know Portland State University is, you know, widely known as an engaged uh, university. And it was one particular seminar that I really enjoyed that lasted for the whole academic year. And it was some sort of a, let's say, reading and discussing club that um, I've never experienced here in, in Croatia. And I'm absolutely sure that things like that don't exist here at a, at a university. And I really do believe that this kind of networking and, and peer learning, peer sharing, you know, bench learning, kind of opportunities were really uh, beneficial for uh, for me because it was the one moment that I realized that this was my opportunity to learn, you know, something something new, my opportunity to extend, you know, my knowledge and, and understanding of all different kind of aspects of, of uh, service learning, you know, even 10 years after being immersed, you know, in the pedagogy itself. And I really appreciated that opportunity. So I think that um, I'm not sure that those kind of practices exist in, in Europe, but since we're all here, maybe we could start thinking about, you know, some practices like that, that we can actually already start by being, you know, international uh, you know, and it was really an easy one. Like we got one paper to read throughout the week, um, you know, to sort of prepare some of your notes and thoughts about some of maybe critiques, dilemmas, whatever. And then, you know, we had like a two hour long coffee break, you know, and discussing and talking about it. Uh, and I know that, I mean, everybody told me at the time that it was, you know, sort of a particular US thing, but was for me, it was a complete novelty and it really helped me and supported my own growth in, you know, understanding service learning on so many different levels. May I? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I absolutely agree with Boyana. That's very much in line with how we work at CLIS. Um, when we, one of the things that we do with universities is we have these support programs uh, in which from, I mean, trainers from CLIS have some, well, on-site, they used to be on-site trainings with a group of teachers from a certain university and online teaching and some kind of, of support throughout a year or two. And I always have the feeling that 
even though, of course, we prepare materials and we, you know, prepare a class, etc. But the most interesting part and the richest part is having teachers from a certain university gathered because it never happened to me. And I've been to lots of universities around the world. It never happened to me to find a university in which this was completely new for everyone. It is generally quite new for many, but not for everyone. There's, in general, there is at least one or two or three teachers who have been doing this without knowing how it's called, as Alina said before, or who have had some experience somewhere, like uh, our Fulbright uh, friend said. Um, it's generally not completely new for everyone. So it's a question of finding the person or the persons, the teachers who are interested in this, who are willing to make it grow. I remember when, one, when I was at Matei Bell University, uh, like four years ago or so, four or five years ago, uh, the, I guess one of the main uh, aims of our visit there was to be able, not, not us, but to gather teachers from different faculties, from different disciplines, willing to make this grow. Because then it's a question of studying and, and learning and looking for partners, but it's finding the right people to make it grow. And from there on, supporting them, having spaces, as Boyana was saying, to meet, to learn from each other, to exchange experiences and how they have uh, solved or, or, you know, faced certain issues. Um, but it's mainly finding the right people. If you are one of those people, it's a question of finding friends, good friends and partners. Um, one teacher can make a great project and that's an excellent starting point. Having good projects is also, I would say, another one of the, again, of the starting points, because that shows the other teachers and vice deans and deans and authorities in our ministries of education that it is possible here also. When I go to universities in different places, they tell me, well, that's because you're from Argentina, or that's because you're from a city, not a, not a rural area, or that's because you are from a big country, or because you're from a whatever, from a poor country. There's always a good reason why it's not possible in that particular place. So having local experiences shows teachers that it is possible there also, and that it is important and useful there also. That is why when we, from CLIES, start working in a new place, one of the first things that we do is try and identify local experiences. So that when I am told that, I can say, well, it is true that it is possible in Buenos Aires, but it is also possible in Slovakia and in Croatia and in, uh, and in the United States and in Romania and in Ukraine and everywhere. It is possible, it is necessary, because as service learning is, I mean, one of its uh, core points has to do with working together with the local community and serving the local needs, then of course you won't be developing Argentine service learning projects in Ukraine to say something. You will be developing Ukrainian service learning projects in Ukraine. As silly as that may sound, it's in the core of understanding how service learning works. If we understand that, then it is possible and it is necessary in any place. Thank you, Luz. Any questions now? from participants. You can write them in the chat also during the, the discussion or then there will be also space to ask. So still you can use the chat. Uh, uh, okay, Zuzka wrote something. Maybe Zuzka, you can tell, tell it. Oh, it was, it's just a small addition about how if you have an opportunity to identify any grants to pay for your students' expenses related to getting to sites and other things, uh, that's also incredibly helpful. And having that expectation that the university could help with that would be, again, something that faculty could save time on. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, let's move to the third questions. Uh, so because 
there was I, you were invited also to share your own experience in developing the service learning project. I'm really interested, like, what do you um, think is your most successful experience or your mo most like per um, uh, exciting personal success uh, when you implemented the service learning project? So something that really like think it's really this was great. <laughs> I'll share uh, maybe not so much a project, but the change and transformation in my thinking about community. Uh, when I started, I had a more experienced colleague who would provide me a very honest feedback on what I was trying to do was nice, but it wasn't real service learning for him because I wasn't putting enough emphasis on the community. I was caring about my students' placement and their teaching experience. And to him, it was more of an internship or more of a practicum. He really pushed me to think more carefully about community impact. So let me give you just two quick, ex one quick example. We don't have so much time. Uh, one of the projects I'm proud of is taking teachers and pre-service teachers from Michigan to Montenegro. We uh, worked with a teacher in Montenegro in a small school and uh, they ran a two week intensive English program. And the very first year it was very much my American teachers coming to a small school and giving this amazing service, this free program, right? But then we really reconceptualized it. And the second year, it was done much more collaboratively. Uh, some of the high school kids were assisting in instruction. Some of the local teachers were co-teaching with us. When we did professional development, it was both Montenegrin teachers presenting their work and the American teachers presenting their work. So it was much more equal, much more reciprocal. And that's something I'm the most proud of is making the transition from a very sort of one-sided to a much more equalized uh, way of doing service learning. Thanks, Oscar. Um, if I may, um, now this particular project that I'm super proud of um, is much larger than the service learning project that we did within it. And it was um, done in a collaboration with the local authorities, with the city of Rijeka and Department of Education and Schooling. And it had a particular importance because of a certain political moment uh, and the and, the, and then again you know in a relation with, with the discipline with the pedagogy it was um, really important for me to give my students an opportunity to be part of such a big story that nobody actually knew how big it's gonna get at the time um, so just a bit of a, of, of a context of a broader context so for for about 20 years, there is a group of great organizations and academics and, and people that are pushing uh, the implementation of citizenship education in Croatian formal uh, education system. And for every single political party, there have always been tons of, you know, excuses for not to do it. And, you know, by neglecting citizenship education for 20 years, in a post-war, you know, country, you know, post-transition country, you have to be aware that, you know, it, it's going to cost you, you know, it's going to cost you at some point. And at a certain point, the city of Rijeka, so the, 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 the last political uh, battle was unsuccessful. The whole educational reform was, you know, um, sort of just pushed away from the political party at a time. Uh, thousands of teachers, thousands of us were engaged, uh, you know, preparing a lot of different kind of documents and they just ignored the whole thing, never contacted any of us anymore. And it was a final, you know, drop that really made us all angry and that it really made a lot of young people angry. And at the time, the city of Rijeka, our local authority, which has always kind of leaned, let's call it to the left, right? It decided that they're going to use their own political power as, as you know, founders of elementary schools, that they're going to do 
the citizenship education in our city and in our elementary schools. And then it was just a mo perfect moment that at a time I was having a course um, that I love to do, you know, by, uh, by using service learning. They needed help, you know, by a large group of people that would be engaged in different kind of smaller projects within this whole uh, story of introducing, you know, citizenship education. So we were doing all different kind of things that were related with, um, you know, um, a small research of community needs and then doing a research with elementary school kids, with their parents, with teachers, you know, with local authorities, uh, with politicians. Uh, uh, then at some point, uh, you know, doing different kind of reflection exercises, again, with kids, with teachers, with parents. So we did this sort of a research kind of reflection part that was just one you know, sort of drop in this whole big, big project. And to make a long story short, the city of Rijeka introduced citizenship education in their own elementary schools. And we were part of, you know, doing a textbook for teachers as well. And then this sort of funny citizenship maps for kids and all different kinds of things. And then it was just an explosion in media with all different kinds of results, research results that, that we had to present. And then just two weeks later, another local authorities came to visit Rijeka and they wanted to implement the Rijeka citizenship model. And within just a couple of months, there were elementary schools across Croatia introducing citizenship education in their own schools. And every single local authority, you know, sort of almost angrily, you know, but decided to use their own power to make educational change within their own elementary schools. And it has been amazingly powerful for my students to see that effect. You know, we were engaged for three months in bits and bytes, you know, the whole projects using bits and bytes of service learning methodology. It was, as Susanna said, at certain points, a total mess, chaos. It was really, really, you know, challenging to, to, to organize, to coordinate every single step, every single student team, all different kind of small research projects. But it took us only three months to make a revolution in citizenship education in Croatia. And it was really important for me to be able to give that kind of experience to my students who are pedagogues to know that actually educational change can be advocated and that there is a methodology of doing it, you know, and at the end, introduction of citizenship education in our elementary schools was evidence-based. And this was something that, that was really, really, really extraordinary and powerful on so many different, um, different levels. And, and, and I, I chose this particular project because it's, uh, it's very different from a regular kind of service learning project, but it was just part of a bigger story. Thank you, Mariana. Alina, do you want to share yeah. your success? Yeah, I will try. Thank you. It was very emotional. Thank you. I, I did take some notes, you know, while Boyana was, <laughs> was telling us about this, uh, this amazing example. And uh, I will frame my example within the humane education, um, you know, uh, part. Because, uh, I mean, you know, in US, uh, service learning, is, it is considered part of humane education if it targets, you know, the benefits and the coexistence of humans, animals, and environment. So um, during one semester, uh, in 2013, we started to, to implement this type of service learning. At that time, I didn't know that it was called service learning. So students, psychology students that were enrolled in my class, animal psychology, were asked to prepare for two months you know, some projects to help NGOs in animal protection to get more visibility, you know, to promote animal adoption and to prevent cruelty through education. So I, I was working with them, you know, I even uh, involved veterinary students, you know, undergrads. So when we had the closure event one day, it was called the day of human animal interactions, you know about this and I showed you pictures and, and uh, then uh, the students, uh, some of the group said, why not bring, um, you know, uh, animals on site? So we, uh, we were allowed to use the yard the, of the University of Agricultural Sciences and Veterinary Medicine. We were there for a whole day. 
So then at the end of the day, the students quantified the number of adoption requests on the number of animals that were adopted, you know. So for them, as Boyana said, it was like a meaningful experience and they were so uh, enthusiastic about, you know, they wrote a lot. I mean, we had the reflections uh, afterwards, but um, they even invited the local radio, you know, the TVs and they said, I mean, they loved the experience, they networked with the veterinary students, but the most important fact was that they managed, you know, to, to promote the, uh, the adoption of animals. And then uh, afterwards, this type of event kind of replicated, like you said, Boyana, you know, and then uh, under different name, we could, uh, you know, uh, we were able to find the structure of the event and we were even invited with the students. They were like, uh, at that time in 2013, 200 students involved from psychology and like 40 from veterinary students. So it was um, uh, an event that allowed replication. Uh, so it was, it was like, uh, you know, community oriented event involving students in relation to the curricular content of, uh, content of uh, the course, animal psychology and some other courses for the veterinary students. So this is the example I wanted to share. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alina. So maybe Luz, you will have like different points because I know that you are not the, uh, you are a person who are helping to develop the service learning project. Mm -hmm. So maybe you will have a little bit different points. Yes, I would like to share an experience that I did not develop. Uh, it's from one of the universities that we have worked with. But I was thinking that um, somehow with, with the different stories that we have heard from the, the friends and the colleagues, uh, we have seen how service learning projects have transformed students, how they have transformed somehow the... the um, the way in which universe, a certain university works, somehow it has transformed communities and, and political systems, if you want to put it that way. Um, well, it definitely transformed teachers and educators. So I would like to share a story, uh, an experience of how um, a service learning experience transformed the curriculum because I think that from the different elements that, that are involved or incorporated in service learning, that story we still haven't heard. I'm sure that you know of many stories of those also, but we haven't heard today, so that's the one I pick. Maybe some of you have heard me tell this story already, but uh, several years ago, <clears throat> here in Argentina, we had a, well, another gigantic economic crisis, probably as big as the one that we are going through now. Um, we are used, we have one every 10 years or so. So by the time you're 20 or 30, you've been through a couple of them. Um, and at that time, it was around more than 10 years ago. Um, the faculty of, uh, well, health, but the, the career of nutrition of the University of La Plata, which is uh, a big city, not the capital city of Argentina, it's the capital city of the province of Buenos Aires. They started working with soup kitchens in um, teaching them how to replace milk for children, uh, replace milk with kefir. I'm sure that many of you know kefir. It's from your region, not mine. Here it's not well known at all. So it, it was something quite, um, you know, new, um, but it was quite interesting for soup kitchens because it was a nutritious uh, element that could enrich the food that these children would eat. So they did all this uh, research and they went to the soup kitchens and worked with uh, the, the cooks at the soup kitchens to teach them how to use it. And that was fantastic because it was, very nutritious, it was of great help during this crisis in which she, chil these children were not receiving enough um, nourishment. If we only looked at that part of the story, we would say, well, it's a nice round service learning project, quite traditional, I would say. When the faculty, the teachers went back to these soup kitchens a few months after for the following semester. 
what the cooks told them, the cooks were not professionals. They had not been to university. Many of them hadn't even gone to school. What the cooks said was, well, all that you did was quite interesting. And I know how nutritious it is, but children hate it. The taste of kefir, they are not used to, they won't eat it. So that's a big problem because even though they had the solution for this malnutrition, it was not being used because children would not eat it. And that was when the following semester, the, the students started working together with the cooks, learning from the cooks how the cooks transformed their traditional recipes to include kefir in those recipes and how the cooks made, it sounds awful, but how the cooks made children have kefir in tastier ways. What happened with that was not only that students saw a more flexible way of uh, treating all the content that they knew, but the university realized that it was not only about the chemistry in food and in uh, nutrition, but there was this human aspect, which was also fundamental. And at a certain point, the university, the, the faculty incorporated a new class in the nutrition career that had to do with anthropology of food or of eating or something like that. I don't remember the exact name. So the university somehow, I mean, the, through this service learning project, the students somehow transformed and improved this need from the community because the, the beneficiaries, let's call them, started eating better food and getting more nutrients. But at the same time, like on the other, with the other arrow, let's say, the community transformed the curriculum of this career because they made them notice that something was missing. And by means of this service learning project, the authorities of the university had to think of their programs again and of their curriculum again to incorporate other um, aspects of nutrition that they hadn't thought of before or not formally at least. So again, and going back to what we said at the beginning, it's about transformation. It's not as uh, Susanna was saying before, when she was talking about this more like vertical relationship that they had established at first and then they realized that they needed to establish a more horizontal relationship with the community. It's about teaching to the community and it's about learning from the community. It needs to be a two-way um, thing. And when we are open to that happening, it really does transform both communities and our educational institutions. And therefore, it, we are transforming uh, society, the world. Thank you really much for your excellent examples. I would never have like such examples <laughs> if I have no you. <laughs> so uh, it's learning also for me. And my last question will be like, because again, we are on the teacher training. So what would you recommend uh, to the teachers who wants to start with service learning? So maybe one of your recommendation at the end and still like we can give the space to the people if they want to ask something or we can, if they want to stay with us so I will be happy. Uh, but my last question would be like, what is your recommendation for the teachers to start service learning? Uh, I can be quick with that. For me, the biggest one is exactly what Luz uh, said at the end, share power. Uh, it has to be a collaboration with the community. It can't be that vertical uh, model. Otherwise, nobody will be left satisfied. You might see some immediate um hopeful signs but it wouldn't be a lasting collaboration and and well, quickly the other one just again embracing the messiness and selling it to students because students like to be told what to do and do a good job and get an a 
So you really have to sell it to them. You really have to justify why this is exactly the kinds of skills they need. Thank you, Zuzka. If I can, if I can continue, uh, I don't know. Um, let's say I, I, I've decided to share three points. Uh, and, you know, with the idea that you are actually starting from the scratch. Uh, so the first one would probably be, I think you're familiar with the KISS metaphor, keep it short and simple, because I think that for all of those starting, uh, it's not about, you know, creating an enormous, big, super impactful service learning project, but it's about um, giving yourself as well a space to experience and to learn, you know, from your own mistakes as well, definitely. So, you know, sort of kiss and, you know, less is more, th those kind of metaphors. That, that would probably be um, something that I, that I would share with you. Uh, the second one would be, and I think you already have that, uh, is to surround yourself with those who have more experience, those who can be, you know, support, who can help you, uh, whom you can ask for help and do that. It, this is not about us being, you know, um, you know, single, single man, woman kind of players and band. This is really about collaboration on all different kinds of levels. And I think it's really, really not only okay, I think it's really important to ask help when you figure out that you've reached a certain point that, that uh, you know, you have no idea how to, how to solve that particular challenge or an issue. And the third one that is coming absolutely from my own personal experience and that it could be related, you know, with a small community that, that we live in is that um, I started collaborating with organizations whom, whose work I was, you know, knowledgeable about and where I knew people. So for me at the beginning, because I, had, I haven't had the opportunity to have any kind of support it was important for me to collaborate with people with whom I knew that I'm not going to be having, you know, crazy moments and challenges with whom I knew that I'm going to devote their time to my students, that they're going to do whatever we agree that we're going to do, uh, that are going to openly communicate with me every challenge, you know, that came within their own organization. And I'm not sure that that kind of advice uh, would be accepted in different kind of service learning contexts. But I'm really honest, it was something that helped me a lot in building positive experience right from the beginning. I, I mean, I might have thousands of more tips and tricks, but I'll stop here at this point. I see, Julia, do you want to ask? So maybe let's uh, end with the, with the recommendations and then there will be space for questions. So Alina, if I can. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Mine is short, uh, I mean, building on what Bojana and Giuliana already said. And, uh, I'm not sure, Luz probably is waiting still to close. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> uh, I mean, from a psychological point of view, you know, I, um, my advice would be uh, never be afraid to innovate and uh, don't set up like perfectionist based goals. You know, I mean, we cannot talk about perfect service learning projects, you know, S think about these projects uh, and your involvement in the projects like prototypes, you know, be like an engineer, behavioral, um, psychological engineer, and like Boyana said, an engineer of positive experiences. Thank you. Thanks. Both. Yes, I think that all the tips that you've given are just perfect. My, what I would say is start. I mean, it goes very much in line with what you have said already. Um, all the experiences that we have shared so far are experiences that have taken time and that have been developed by teachers uh, that, I mean, these projects were not their first service learning project. I mean, um, Susanna shared what was her first experience and how she then changed it. I said, about, I mean, I talked about this experience, how it was done first, it did not work completely well. And then in the second, uh, round, let's say, it worked better. Boyana said something similar. So I would say just go ahead and start as, as uh, colleagues have said, um, 
make use of your colleagues, I mean, support each other. Today, you have a lot of, of information available, all the materials that Liha project developed and are in your own languages. So there's nothing better than that. We have a lot of materials in English also. I mean, there are lots of materials, but you even have materials in your own language. So make use of that uh, and start. And the following one will be much better and even more so the next one. But um, once you start, you kind of start seeing how it goes. But at the same time, I think even though it might be difficult, when you see the faces of your students and how motivated they are, and you realize how this kind of fills your heart somehow, and the communities want more, then that motivates you for more and to improve them also. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ladies. So now is the time for the questions. Still, we are like more than one hour, but if there are any questions and you can stay, I will be happy. So if you can answer. So Yulia, you wanted to ask something. So now it's your turn. Hello, everyone again. Uh, I'm from Ukraine. Uh, and we are located in the western part of Ukraine, Lviv, and I'm from Ukrainian Catholic University. We are a private uh, university and with Catholic identity. And actually, we have uh, lots of uh, experience with uh, service learning or uh, proto-service learning activities. And what is actually... Uh, for our team that we work on the service learning, uh, bringing to the institutional level for our university. Uh, we are at the moment of actually identifying um, not the, uh, the, not the quantitative, but the qualitative features of the service learning. And I wonder what should be uh, or maybe you have used some uh, KPIs in your practice for the service learning, like both, uh, because we differentiate service learning projects and service learning courses. And uh, currently we think about uh, our internal awards for teachers, um, currently like this semester, uh, that they have implemented either project or course in service learning. But the question is, what uh, what should we think and uh, build in into our university system about the quality, the quality side? Because we negotiate a lot with the community partners uh, and we have uh, on the bachelor level and on the master level. So the level of the students is very different. So still, uh, is it possible to have at least, I don't know, three like basic KPIs to think about the quality. Maybe you can share some, at least some ideas. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I think we could have a, a whole seminar or a different session just focus on evaluation, but that would be my uh, quick uh, sort of feedback. Work with your community partner on designing an evaluation document together um, so that it's really meaningful for everybody and really authentic rather than something you sort of feel like you have to do to have some proof of effectiveness. Thank you, Zana. Want to add somebody, something, Ulf or Boyana? Uh, yeah, I think this is a great question. And, and it's, you know, when people say $1 million kind of question, <laughs> uh, um, it is, I think it's a context specific. Uh, I would definitely say that um, for me, one really important element of the quality is the co-creation. But at the same time, it's something that um, I'm almost not able to practice in my own institutional environment, having in mind, you know, the boxes, the procedures, uh, all the timeline that we need to follow in, you know, designing a course and, and, you know, administrating it and making it available online and all these kind of things that, that, for example, a course that I'm teaching the next semester needs to be done six months in advance and needs to be available online. And students do not have any opportunity to be co-creators of, of the whole story. So, so, in its best version, it's, you know, between me and a certain community partner and then sort of kind of giving the students 
this is it done. You need to do this. So we were thinking of, um, it's about not thinking out of the box, but it's about creative thinking inside the box. <laughs> I, d- I don't know if I said it uh, in a way, you know, for me to understand, because there are simply certain procedures that were, that are still hindering me to implement service learning and all those quality nuances that I think you are now looking for in a way, because just the system itself is not open for that kind of co-creation process, for that kind of collaborative process. So I'm just sort of picking bits and bytes, you know, of, of the process within a course where I can allow my students to have at least a certain freedom to pick up a certain assignment or, you know, uh, um, a certain small part of the project because, for example, they cannot um, choose the partner. They cannot choose the organization with whom we are going to collaborate that particular semester. That's on me because that has to be done so many months in advance. But I would always, you know, fight for this sort of co-creation element to be a um, very important element of the, of the quality. And if not co-creation itself, then at least co-creation in certain elements like it was advised now, at least in the evaluation then, if not in a co-creation of the course, you know, itself and all the assignments uh, for, uh, for students. Um, and that co-creation, I think, kind of um, is complementary to the collaboration itself. Uh, and I think Luz raised the importance of that several times of, of already in different kind of contexts. Uh, you know what I say, no nubi solum, not only for ourselves. So how to translate that into communicating with, with community. And, and yeah, I, I don't think that I was helpful, Julia. I'm sorry. I just had this <laughs> urge to sort of communicate that even when you are aware of certain quality elements that are important, you need to be aware of the box you're working in, you know, and then trying to find the best out of it. And then even somebody said before, you know, embrace the messiness, even embrace those elements and don't get those discourage you. You know, just sort of be creative within, within the box. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, actually, there was a moment that I was thinking maybe apply this social impact methodologies that exist uh, for the service learning courses and projects but also uh, that's that's the problem of the measurement right yeah <laughs> what you will if, take if i can share one experience with you uh if you have time um i know i'm i i know i'm a talkative person but bear with me please uh because it was just um it's a one year long um story that um i was engaged as an evaluator from the beginning till the end of a certain service learning course at my at my university, and I compl- I decided to embrace the qualitative approach from the beginning till the end. I am a qualitative researcher, so it, it was kind of a natural field field for me. Uh, the report that ended up was amazing. It was such a brilliant, rich narratives coming out of those students' experiences and stories. And I opt for various, um, th- there is this whole aspect of uh, creative qualitative research methods. So for example, my students, uh, I, my students, students from the course, I invited them to write a farewell letters to their mentors in organizations. At the last meeting, we were all crying. I'm just going to say that. You cannot measure that. Yeah, sorry. Not the impact measurement kind of person. I simply think that every kind of methodology, how sophisticated it is, simply cannot embrace those nuances and those moments of transformation, you know, of... Um, change, you know, of empowerment, of of the habitus change, not only from students, but from their own family members, because students were sharing those kind of stories, you know, how their parents, you know, start rethinking some of their own attitudes, how their grandparents, 
you know, started to rethink some of their own attitudes. That's an impact that I, I simply don't have an answer how we can measure it other by just simply being the storytellers. Thank you, Bojana. <laughs> May I? Um, I definitely <laughs> agree with Bojana in that uh, it's hard to measure some things. Simultaneously, I think that we do need to measure some things as difficult as it may be, because that facilitates convincing others, others being colleagues, others being students and, and parents and families, others being ministries of education. Um, so in line with what um, Susanna mentioned about creating, I, I mean, going back to, to Julia's original question, I, of course, agree with uh, creating this evaluation method together with the community. And another indicator that I would incorporate has to do with whether our students learned what we wanted them to learn or not. Uh, because that is, uh, again, an indicator of whether this was a beautiful project as far as, you know, our spirit is concerned or whether it was a good class. And in service learning, we need to be a good class apart from being motivating and all this kind of thing. So um, for those of you who have been teaching classes already in a certain way and are considering incorporating service learning, it's like a good baseline in a way to see whether students from previous semesters and from semesters working with service learning have learned around the same or if they have learned more or less, <clears throat> sorry, because what, I, what I've seen happen a lot is that uh, students turn, tend to learn more, not only because reality faces you with the need to know better than, than theory itself, but also because reality poses them with certain difficulties. Uh, that maybe we will not ask in a, in a test, uh, but that's what real life is like. And that's what the world of, of work will face them with. So more than welcome. So that I would say could be another quality um, standard, let's say. Thank you, Wolf. This is Peter from Bethlehem. Uh, I'm curious as to what kinds of reflective activities, you know, uh, are used in, in some of the courses, projects uh, to help uh, the students, uh, you know, experience some of this, well, to reflect on this, this change that's happening in them and the meaning of that in, you know, in their lives. Um, I guess that's, you know, part of what I'd be interested in hearing. I don't know if that's a clear question, but what kinds of reflective tool, uh, tools to guide the students in their reflection? Anybody who wants to answer is the one lesson in the course <laughs> or more. There I can be many. quick because I was just uh, sharing some amazing resources for reflections. I started for the first few years of doing service learning. I primarily had students write sort of longer reflections. And you come to a point where um, you get a little burnt out because, you know, after a while, students start saying the same things. And if you have a lot of students, it becomes hard. So there are many different ways of experimenting with reflection. Uh, so I will put in the chat a few resources, or if I don't have a chance before this is over, I'll make sure that uh, Betka has a few links that have people have really liked um, and implemented across different fields to share with you. Thank you. Uh, if, if I may add, I just sent a screenshot. Uh, I, I was looking for a certain presentation and I just did a screenshot of one slide, but I have a lot of resources on that as well, if you would be interested. Um, I, 
I think that the reflection is probably the, the one element of service learning that helped me grow as well as a teacher and as a parent. And I remember at the beginnings, I was, you know, sort of uh, stuck within a box, you know, of familiar, of what I was okay with, of what I had experience with, because, you know, I know how to write essays. So I love writing, I like reading. So, you know, I was just opting for essays. And then, you know, throughout the years, I figured it out that um, it, it, it was selfish it was not okay it was uh, not creative enough uh, and um today i'm like super relaxed open for any kind of experience that students uh want themselves to have i even have i, I mean those are in creation but uh, i have students writing poems about about certain issues and and their own experience i have students you know um doing videos or um you know depending on the project angry students you know or um doing a plan how to make a protest or whatever so i'm at this point all over the place which is probably not okay <laughs> to be that that open and flexible as well but I'm trying to get as much as different kind of reflective platforms, usually guided by a certain, you know, question or a couple of those questions, but then in, in the context of a form of a platform for students uh, to communicate, I'm open for, you know, art reflection, music kind of reflection, poetry reflection, uh, you know, writing a letter to a mayor reflection or all different kind of um, things. And I find it uh, enriching for students and for me as well, because, you know, I end up having actually great job, <laughs> you know, reading a poem or looking through a, you know, certain video or a poster or, you know, making plans for a protest or all different kind of things or um, radio podcasts, uh, pro particularly now throughout this year, we used a lot of different kind of digital platforms for them to, to uh, do reflection. Uh, so um, at least for my students, radio podcasts ended up being, you know, very, um, very interesting. And, and they, they really invested a lot of energy in creating those. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you also for questions. So okay so thank you ladies for coming and for finding the time and sharing all of your amazing experiences it was really like uh, empowering also for me and also to be with you for such like, online settings maybe these are the advantages <laughs> that we have now uh, to connect together thank you Boyana for this idea of the reading club so maybe we can continue with these sessions and to organize like also for us to sharing and to, to have it uh, now in these online settings. So maybe we can develop this idea uh, also to, together. And so thank you also for all of you for coming to this like sharing sessions. And I hope we will also meet personally somehow somewhere, uh, which is more intensive. <laughs> and I know. and. Uh, if you have any questions or if you want to stay in the contact, uh, I will write now in the, my email to the chat because there are also people who uh, I have been not in contact, but I think that all of you have been. So maybe we can also share our contacts uh, later and you can write me if you want to stay with somebody in the contact. Okay. Okay. So have a nice day. All of you, and Thank I you hope so to see you soon. Thank you, Batka. Thank, Thank you all for all. coming. Thanks Bye. for organizing this. Bye -bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 See you later. Yeah, see you guys, later. It's so great to Luz. see you. Sorry? Luz, Bye, Luz. Want, nice to see you. If you want to nice join, to we see have you. a glass I'm, of wine. I'm looking at Yanka's baby. <laughs> so beautiful.
<laughs> okay, so see you later. See Bye. You, you. Ladies, at what time? It's seven. Seven. See you later. Bye bye. Who's, do you want to join for a glass of wine online at seven? Well, what time would that be? <laughs> I think it's uh, midday for me. I would love to, but but still too early. <laughs> I huh? believe it's not that such a good idea. It should be a little later. Thank you very much for inviting. And I do um, definitely appoint myself for the on-site one. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, ladies. See you soon.